The year was 569 BC, and King Nebuchadnezzar was the uncontested ruler of the known world. Elam, Assyria, Syria, Tyre, and Israel had all surrendered. And within a year, Egypt would fall as well. Nebuchadnezzar was the ruler of the most powerful empire at that time and that had ever existed up to that point in history. So Nebuchadnezzar is quite literally the most powerful man alive and to have ever lived, at least up to that point. His borders and territories were secured. There were no more wars to fight, no more nations to conquer. At this point, he had completed upwards of 50 building projects, the most notable of which being in the city of Babylon itself. Babylon was also the most fortified city in the world. It was surrounded by a moat and then enclosed by a sophisticated series of double walls. The inner double wall, the inner layer was 21 feet thick and then the outer layer of that double wall was 11 feet thick. It said that chariots could patrol and race on top of the walls fortifying the city and at different intervals there were watchtowers and guard towers. So Nebuchadnezzar could just sort of sit back at rest and peace in his kingdom knowing it is secured and flourishing. Until one fateful night, he had a dream, the images of which disrupted his peace and terrified his heart. You see, ancient peoples had a little different view of how the world works than we in our modern minds typically permit. Not again. See, ancient peoples believed that there was a spiritual realm. And this spiritual realm existed right beside our physical realm. And at times, there was this intersection overlap between the two realms. See, nothing that happened, not even things we would normally consider are just the outworking of natural causes. Nothing that happened happened by chance. Everything that happened was the result of the interplay between the realm of the gods and the realm of man. And you might call it superstitious or primitive, but they would have just said, this is reality. There are forces at play in this world that you just cannot test in a laboratory. And so they believed in gods and demons and omens and signs and prophecies. There were forces to be feared and warnings to be heeded. And dreams were often couriers of these divine warnings. There are often messages contained in dreams, and these messages were like riddles that needed to be deciphered and interpreted. And in this polytheistic pagan culture of Babylon, it was a dream interpretation was a form of divination. And so it combined magic and sorcery and astrology and a good grasp of wisdom and literature and history and they sort of combined all these things and so when Nebuchadnezzar had this dream he immediately called all the enchanters and astrologers and magicians and diviners to his court to interpret this dream and maybe even tell him how he could avoid its outcome if it's a negative outcome but they were unable to interpret it <clears throat> or maybe unwilling Maybe they knew it was a negative dream and it couldn't be avoided and they just didn't really want to tell him. But then Belteshazzar enters. Belteshazzar's Hebrew name is Daniel. And like his pagan neighbors, Daniel also believes there's more going on in this world than meets the eye. Daniel also believes in demons and angels and celestial beings. Daniel also believes that there is this spiritual realm and it overlaps and intersects with our physical present realm. Daniel also believes that dreams sometimes carry messages that can illuminate the future. There's just one key difference between what Daniel believes 
and what the Babylonians believed. And that related to his faith and belief in the one true God. See, Daniel worshipped and submitted not to a pantheon of gods, but he worshipped and submitted to the one true creator God. And he believed that everything, both in the spiritual realm and in the physical realm, was ultimately under the sovereign authority of God Almighty. And so he was okay with interpreting dreams, but he would not seek any other counsel, any other wisdom outside of God himself. This microphone does not like me. Jared puts it in his pocket and works. Let's put it in my pocket. See if that works. <laughs> Daniel, he had this wisdom and this insight and this ability to interpret dreams. It still doesn't like that. This is ridiculous. Jared, what's your secret? Uh, I'm going to use a handheld. Is that okay? Uh, there we are. The only difference is I use a different cord. Maybe this mic is, maybe the cord's bad. We'll go with the handheld though. Because that will be distracting for the next hour and a half of my message. <laughs> I kid, I kid. We all got to eat lunch sometime, okay? I get hungry too. <sighs> so where was I, you know? I don't even have my notes up here. What was I talking about? Oh, Daniel, right? So Daniel believes in the one true God. And he has this wisdom and ability to interpret, but it comes from God himself. And Nebuchadnezzar, he's had a run-in with this Hebrew God before. It happened years before this. And it involved three friends in an oven. And Nebuchadnezzar likely doesn't have a problem believing in the existence of this Hebrew God. They had this polytheistic worldview, and so you just added this God to the rest. So Nebuchadnezzar didn't have a problem believing in Yahweh. He just had a problem submitting to Yahweh. But he understood and knew that Daniel had this commitment to this God, and that it permeated every aspect of his life. And while he may not have fully understood Daniel's beliefs, there's something about Daniel. Three times in chapter 4, Daniel, or Nebuchadnezzar describes Daniel as having the spirit of the holy gods. And so he's saying there is something different about him, and whatever it is, it has a holy and divine origin. And so Nebuchadnezzar respected Daniel, and he invited him to interpret this dream. And so he retells the dream in detail. And this is what he saw. There's this large open field, and at the center of the field, there was a tree. And this tree was enormous, the circumference of which was massive and broad and deeply rooted. And the top of the tree, it stretched to the heavens, and you could see this tree from miles and miles away. And it was bursting with life. The leaves on the tree were healthy and green and beautiful. And there was an abundance of fruit on this tree for all to eat. Both man and beast found sustenance in the fruit of this tree. And the branches of this tree provided homes for the birds and shelter for the land animals. So far, this is a pretty good dream. Healthy tree, big, enormous fruit. But then... He says there was a messenger. An angelic messenger came and declared a decree. And this is what he said. The messenger shouted, Cut down the tree and lop off its branches. Shake off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Chase the wild animals from its shade and the birds from its branches, but leave the stump and the roots in the ground bound with a band of iron and bronze and surrounded by tender grass. Now let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the wild animals among the plants of the field. For seven periods of time, let him have the mind of a wild animal instead of the mind of a human. 
For this has been decreed by the messengers. It is, a com- is commanded by the holy ones so that everyone may know that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world. He gives them to anyone he chooses, even to the lowliest, lowliest of people. Daniel was visibly shaken by the revelation that came to his mind. The way the language in the text, it it, it gives this idea that he was just utterly distraught and speechless. And he's not afraid for his own life. His concern is for the implications of this dream concerning Nebuchadnezzar. And so his emotional reaction, it's unfiltered and unplanned, and the king notices it, and there's this warm interaction as the king says, Belteshazzar, don't let the dream or its interpretation alarm you. In other words, it's okay. Say what you need to say. The dream has to do with Nebuchadnezzar's future. He is the tree. His riches and his glory is renowned. You can see it from far off. And his dominion is vast. And his power is uncontested. But it has gone to his head. He has failed to realize his own limitations and his own mortality. He has failed to recognize that he has no control over the oxygen that he breathes and is so dependent on for life. He has failed to recognize that God alone is most high and sovereign over all the nations. His pride, it's reached its limit. And so the decree to cut down the tree is foretelling his own demise, his own humiliation. He will be stripped of his power. And what is worse, he'll be stripped of his control over his own mental faculties. He will go mad. And his madness will drive him into isolation, and he will eat grass like an ox and live outside like an animal. But his madness is not, it's not retribution. It's meant for his reformation. See, God's desire is his redemption, not his destruction. And that is revealed in the reality that it is temporary. It is for seven periods of time. A lot of translations translate it as seven years, but the, the truth is the, the language is a little ambiguous. Seven often symbolizes wholeness or completeness, and then the word for the period of time is imprecise. It could be days, months, years, and so it could just be saying that this period of time will be as long as it takes to complete Nebuchadnezzar's reformation. But there is hope. There's a promise. That stump symbolizes the hope of new birth, that a sprout would come from the stump, and that when Nebuchadnezzar recognized the lordship, when he recognized the king of heaven as being the most high, the kingdom would be restored to him. So Daniel advises him encourages him to repent of his ways. The other diviners likely would have prescribed some sort of ritualistic hoops for him to jump through so he could appease the gods and possibly avert this calamity. Daniel does not prescribe to him the performance of religious rituals. He prescribes the reformation of his ways. So often, it would actually seem easier to rigidly and legalistically follow a religious set of rules than actually allow our hearts to be transformed. What Daniel prescribes is that he repent, that he do what is right, and that he is kind to the oppressed. And it would have been easier It would have been easier for Nebuchadnezzar to just sacrifice a thousand bulls than to actually submit to the lordship of God and reform his ways. And so 12 months pass by. 12 months he has the opportunity to repent and turn to God. But he's walking on the roof of his palace one day and he's looking out at the majestic city of Babylon. And he says to himself, 
Is this not the great Babylon I have built for the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? As the words were coming off of his lips, he heard a voice from heaven and it declared something familiar, something he heard in a dream a year ago. And in that moment, he had a mental breakdown and went mad. He was driven from civilization. He ate grass like an ox and lived outside. The psychological, technical, clinical term for his psychosis is boanthropy. It's a real thing. And Nebuchadnezzar, for however long it took, was driven away and lived like an animal. And the, the time came to a close when he lifted his gaze to heaven, when he recognized his need for God and repented of his ways. When he looked towards heaven, God restored and returned his sanity back to him. And with his sanity and his reason came the kingdom and the glory and the splendor of his kingdom. But now Nebuchadnezzar has a right view of his place in the universe. Now he has a right perspective and he has a right view of God and he honors and glorifies the king of heaven. And in our Bibles, there is this almost like a psalm written by this pagan king. In Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar says, after this time had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven. My sanity returned, and I praised and worshipped the Most High and honored the one who lives forever. And then listen, this sounds like a psalm almost. His rule is everlasting, and his kingdom is eternal. All the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the people of the earth. No one can stop him or say to him, what do you mean by doing these things? Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honor the king of heaven. All his acts are just and true, and he is able to humble the proud. This is a remarkable story of someone who lived in sin, of someone who did not believe in God. This remarkable story of their conversion. And I imagine that all of us here, we probably have a Nebuchadnezzar in our life. And I don't mean someone who's really successful and prideful about it. I mean someone who just, they've not yet submit. maybe pride is their issue, but it's someone in our life who's not yet submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We all probably know someone who is not reconciled in a right relationship with God. And in this series, we've been looking at what does it look like to live faithfully in Babylon? What does it look like to live faithfully when we're in a culture that doesn't necessarily reflect our values and our faith? And is it sometimes actually contrary to our faith and our beliefs and our values? What does it look like when we are in that place, living in Babylon to live faithfully? So the question I want to take a deep dive into this morning is this. What can we learn from Daniel about being a vessel through whom God can reach others with his love? What can we learn from Daniel about being a vessel through whom God can reach others with his love. And I'm going to lay my cards on the table. I think what we learn from Daniel is that we have to love people. And Jesus taught as much. In John chapter 13, Jesus said, By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. And then in Matthew 22, Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. But then the language that is next is important. The second is like it. In the original language, it's, it's saying, it's communicating. It is as weighty. It is as important. You cannot separate this one from the other. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so we don't think, well, in the first passage, Jesus is talking about loving one another, other believers, other disciples. And so we don't think that our neighbor only means people who are like us, who think like us, who agree with us, who have our political views and align with our faith views. So we don't think that in Matthew 5, Jesus says, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. 
But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. See, we most reflect that we know and understand the Father's heart when we love people. And almost 600 years before Jesus taught this, Daniel understood it. He understood God's heart, and he loved Nebuchadnezzar. In verse 19, it's a small verse, but his reaction, his concern is genuine. His concern for the king's future, for what this would mean for him is genuine, and his desire for it to be for his enemies and not for him is sincere, and his speaking the truth in love to Nebuchadnezzar to repent and turn from his ways. All of this is birthed out of Daniel's heart. He cares for the king. But why and how? Remember, Nebuchadnezzar is the one responsible for the destruction of his God's temple. Nebuchadnezzar is the one who deposed his nation's king. And Nebuchadnezzar is the one who deported his people to this foreign land. Daniel, when he was but a teenager, was taken as a captive to this land and forced to serve in the empire. Daniel should hate him. Nebuchadnezzar is his enemy, and he should serve Babylon begrudgingly. But at some point in his many, many years in Babylon, Daniel decided he would not let resentment grow in his heart. And at some point, he came to love and care about these people who were so different, who did not share his beliefs in the one true God, and some of whom did not like him because he was a Hebrew. At some point, Daniel decided, I'm going to love these people. I believe there are three things we can learn about Daniel's love. And they're not explicitly there in Daniel 4, but I think we can see that this had to have taken place. I believe Daniel had to have forgiven Nebuchadnezzar. At some point, he forgave him. He showed grace to him, and he spoke the truth in love. Daniel forgave Nebuchadnezzar for all the atrocities he had committed against his people. Forgiveness is one of the most challenging things Christ calls us to, but it is one of the most powerful. But it feels so wrong. Because forgiving someone, it feels like you're letting them off the hook. It feels actually sometimes like you're vindicating their innocence. Like what they did wasn't really that bad. Or what is worse, forgiving them feels like it minimalizes the pain that they have caused you. Like, like you have to say, well, it wasn't that big of a deal. I was, I was just being overly sensitive. But forgiveness is just the opposite. Forgiveness implies, it actually necessitates that there is a wound that has been dealt. Forgiveness is only necessary when someone has wronged, someone has hurt you, when they have offended you. And that wound, that wound that is dealt, in the midst of unforgiveness, it grows. Unforgiveness allows that wound to become infected with resentment. And resentment thrives when we rehearse what that person or what those people did to us, did to me. When we relive the pain, and as we relive it, it never has the chance to fully heal. And so the only way, the only way to find healing from that wound that someone else has, has committed against us, the only way is through the act of forgiveness. 
And there's some sort of spiritual law at work through forgiveness. And I don't fully understand it, but it seems that if we withhold forgiveness from other people, we cannot receive God's forgiveness. And I think this is why. Because in order to receive God's forgiveness, we have to recognize our own sin and our own propensity to hurt others and our own selfishness. We have to recognize that. But when we withhold forgiveness, we are actually standing in the place of superior moral high ground. We're actually standing in the place that says we have not done anything wrong. And so as so long as we are in that place, we cannot receive God's forgiveness. But here's the powerful thing that happens. When we see ourself as needing God's forgiveness, when we recognize that we have hurt others, that we are selfish we are confronted with the truth that we are not that different from the person who hurt us. That we, just like they, are in need of God's grace and forgiveness and rescue. And when we start to see people, even people who have hurt us, as people whom God loves and whom God desires to forgive and whom God desires to restore and whom God desires to reconcile with himself, when we start seeing people through those eyes, a transformation happens and our resentment is transformed into compassion, a compassion-filled desire for their redemption. And then this mysterious work of healing happens in our hearts because God's forgiveness is able to flow to us and through us. Daniel forgave Nebuchadnezzar and he showed grace to him. See, when we realize that God through Christ has shown grace to us and we realize that grace isn't a transaction, it's not something we can earn or deserve. If you're trying to earn or deserve it, whatever it is, it's not grace. Because grace, it only works when we actually do not have the capacity to earn or deserve it. That's why it's grace. And when we realize that God has shown us grace through Christ, we are compelled to share that grace with other people. And grace lived out, it looks like it looks like understanding. It looks like patience. It looks like listening. It looks like compassion. It looks like humility. It looks like the benefit of the doubt. It looks like extending forgiveness again. It looks like love. And Christ has called us to share with those around us the same grace he has given us. And so for Christ's sake, may your love be saturated with the grace of Jesus that has been given to you. But love and grace does not exclude proclaiming the truth in love. Daniel accurately relayed the message from the dream. He did not sugarcoat it, and he did not avoid it. And he also called Nebuchadnezzar to repentance. He invited him to repent of his sins. If we love people, it, it means we actually have to be honest about the truth of their condition and their consequences. And if we love people, it means we also want to invite them to repentance. But we need to notice something here because so often people use this appeal to truth that the truth offends. And this is just the truth. And this is if Daniel did not find any delight, any joy, any satisfaction, or any vindication or self righteousness in declaring God's judgment to Nebuchadnezzar. And if in us we just claim that, well, the truth offends, and that's really just our hate masquerading as self-righteousness, then we don't understand what it means to speak the truth in love. 
And I also want to point out, Daniel's speaking to Nebuchadnezzar was built on a long relationship. Nebuchadnezzar knew Daniel, and he said, there's three times in the text, this repetition is important. There's a spirit in Daniel, and it's different. And Nebuchadnezzar tells him when he's visibly concerned about the dream's interpretation, Nebuchadnezzar says, Daniel, it's okay. He invites him to speak truth into his life. There is a relationship there where Nebuchadnezzar knows Daniel genuinely cares about him. He's not just bludgeoning him with the truth. We need to recognize that as well. That is there. Daniel spoke the truth, but Nebuchadnezzar knew. He knew Daniel's heart. There was a spirit in him that was different. We need to forgive people. Show them grace and speak the truth in love. And often that means being honest about where they're at and inviting them to repent. But we can't demand it. We can't force it. We can't determine whether they repent. But we can invite them to. In his book, Searching for God Knows What, Donald Miller and I just want to tell you, I want to preface this. You probably wouldn't agree. A lot, of, a lot of us would not agree with everything Donald Miller says. But he says something really powerful. And I want to read it to you. But he, he tells about this time. And this, this was published back in 2004. So this was long before any of our current things going on right now. But he is invited on a radio show. And uh, being interviewed by the host. And at one point in the interview, the the host asked him about his opinion on the homosexuals trying to take over our country. And Donald Miller recognized that this question was intending to sort of trap him. That he either had to point out the sin and marginalize and ostracize a whole group of people. And sometimes we're guilty of that. It's really easy to talk about their sin. But we don't like it much if there's a sin we struggle with when it's highlighted, especially like on a radio talk show. We probably wouldn't want that. But this question was trying to get him to either say something that would marginalize and ostracize a whole group of people or say something that would get the conservative listeners of his radio show kind of riled up against Donald Miller. And Donald Miller just decides not to play that game. And he just simply tries to get him to be specific. Well, which... What group, what homosexual group exactly are you talking about? Who are you talking about? Ready to, well, you know, I mean, they're out there. And he, he continues to press and say, like, let's get specific. And at one point, the, the host says, listen, I, I, I get your point. And Miller says, but I don't think you do. Here is my position. As Christian, as a Christian, I believe Jesus wants to reach out to people who are lost. And yes, immoral immoral just like you and I are immoral. And declaring war against them and stirring up your listeners to the point of anger and giving them the feeling that their country, their families, and their lifestyles are being threatened is only hurting what Jesus is trying to do. This isn't rocket science. If you declare war on somebody, you have to either handcuff them or kill them. That's the only way to win. But if you want them to be forgiven by Christ... If you want them to live eternally in heaven with Jesus, then you have to love them. The choice is yours, and my suspicion is you will be held responsible by God, a judge who will know your motives. So go ahead and declare war in the name of a conservative agenda, but don't do it in the name of God. That's what militant Muslims are doing in the Middle East, and we don't want that here. Now, some of you, your minds are off in the political weeds. But I want to bring it back and just point out his statement. When we declare war on people, the only option is to handcuff them or kill them. This is not what Christ has called us to be about. And Paul says it like this. He says, yes, we are in a spiritual battle. But the war is not against flesh and blood. It's not against other people. I have this suspicion that because all of us have homes where we are surrounded by imperfect people and jobs where we are surrounded by imperfect people, 
And if we are honest, admitted that we were imperfect people, it is my suspicion that each one of us have the opportunity to forgive somebody almost every single day. But it's also my suspicion because sometimes some of those little things, I mean, we just kind of brush them off and we forget about them and they, they, they don't stick. But every now and then, an offense, it sort of gets lodged in our soul and it just, it's stuck. And sometimes we don't recognize it until it starts just spilling over with toxicity. So I have a suspicion that there may be some of you here this morning, whether it's a Facebook rant that just ruffled your feathers, or something as terrible as someone doing something to you, maybe a parent or a close relative when you were a child, I have a suspicion that there's someone here who possibly needs to forgive, to let it go, to trust God with that, that person, that wrong, and allow him to heal you. And I want to invite you to do, to respond in two ways. I want to invite you to repent. And that's going to feel awful. Because they are the ones, they're the ones who wronged you. Why do you need to repent? But I want to invite you to confess your unforgiveness. Acknowledge that it doesn't line up with God's heart and ask him to forgive you for withholding forgiveness. And then if there's an inkling in your heart, a, 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 just the remotest desire to release them, this is important. I want you to declare forgiveness over them. So often, ministering with people, they say, God, help me forgive. What I'm asking you to do is not, God, help me forgive. I'm asking you if you are able to say it with even a, the slightest bit of sincerity, I'm asking you to say this. In Jesus' name, I forgive. I'm drawing a line in the sand today. I forgive whoever for whatever. And I believe the degree to which there is a desire in your heart for that to be true, I believe God can take that, that desire, however small it may be, and do something powerful and allow you to forgive and to allow healing in your soul to begin. Some of you here, maybe you find yourself being a little rigid with people. Maybe sometimes you don't even know why. You just, people annoy you. Because everything they do, you just find something to criticize or, or it's, it's just easy for you to to assume other people's motives, and you just, you're just not very gracious with others. Maybe it's the people in your own home. Maybe it's coworkers. I want to invite you to repent as well. To ask God to forgive you for being stingy with grace. And then ask Jesus to fill you with grace so you overflow with grace. Maybe you're here and you're really passionate about the truth. But if you are honest with yourself, and if you're here and this is you, you know it, there's a little bit of you that it's not really that you have a desire for other people to recognize the truth and be made right with God. It's really that you, you like to be right. And in your pursuit of being right, your motives have been wrong. I want to invite you to repent of the self-righteousness, of the desire to just be right. And ask God to help you to speak the truth in love, that, that you're bold proclamation of the truth would be saturated in love and that those, those selfish motives of just wanting to prove 
your superiority or prove you're right or tell people how wrong they are so you feel good about how right you are, that God would just sort of wash and cleanse that away and then give you the wisdom, the discernment, to speak the truth in the way Jesus did. Scripture says Jesus was full of grace and truth. May you be full of grace and truth. I think Daniel was. And God used him to reach one of the most powerful rulers in history. And there's no reason to believe that psalm at the end, at the close of chapter 4, was not representative of Nebuchadnezzar's sincere, genuine conversion. Every first Sunday, we participate in the Lord's Supper. And this is an act of remembering by participating in significant symbols. The bread represents Christ's body that was broken for you and the juice, his blood, shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And so as we participate in communion this morning, I want to invite you to come to the table and bring with you the response that, that fits you. And as you come and receive the bread and receive the juice, May it be a reminder that you are receiving God's forgiveness through Christ. But as you quite literally go from here with that bread and juice inside of you, may it remind you that you are going from here with the life of Christ in you. And you are called to reflect the same love grace, forgiveness, and truth that has been given to you. So as you come to the table, may it be both a response and an act of worship.